Welcome to Video Sunday School. My name is Cassie Waits. I am the Associate Pastor of Discipleship at First Presbyterian Church of Marietta, and I'm glad that you are joining us today. We are digging into an interesting and timely topic, the spread of epidemics and the rise of Christianity. And we're going to take a look at two plagues that hit ancient Rome right around the start of the early church. And we're going to ask the question, in light of that history of, our, of Christianity, what lessons do we learn and what might it mean for us today as we have the coronavirus bearing down on us, not just in our city, in our nation, but around the world? What is the role of Christians in this time? So we're going to start with the plague of Antonine. This was a plague that hit Rome in the second century. It's also called the plague of Galen. Galen was a Greek doctor who treated and diagnosed and described many of the symptoms of this plague. We think that this plague spread from Roman troops who were returning from military campaigns from the Near East. And what we find is that what they brought back with them was particularly lethal. The Roman historian Dio Cassius estimates that this epidemic at its height took about 2,000 lives per day. This was a devastating epidemic for Rome. It not only weakened the foundations of the Roman military system, there were simply not enough military personnel to go around. Mm -hmm. It also loosened the grip of Roman power across the region, and it challenged the vast economic and social structures of the empire. Now, what's interesting about the impact of this particular plague is that the result was an increase in religious fervor. See, at this time, no one really understood where diseases came from or exactly what might cause them or even how they were transmitted. And the prevailing wisdom was that if you were stricken with a sickness or a disease or an illness, it must be evidence that the gods were displeased with you or with your community. And so the people of Rome reacted in the best way they knew how. And in light of this plague, they redoubled their efforts uh, at religion and they grew in their religious fervor. It wasn't only the non-Christians who coalesced around their religions following this plague. The Christians also began to coalesce, and Christianity and the church grew stronger, uh, having made it through this plague, at least for those who did make it through the plague. Now we jump ahead, not a hundred years later, to a second plague. This is the plague of Cyprian. Cyprian was the bishop of Carthage, and the plague is named after him because he wrote uh, an eyewitness account of what he saw happening and how the plague was affecting the city around him. And it wasn't just in the city of Rome that this plague hit, but all across the Roman Empire. It moved from the southeast to the northwest. And unlike the plague of Antonine, which was marked by symptoms like cough and rash, this plague had some very extreme symptoms. Scholars have wondered what this plague might have been, and they've, they've guessed that it could be something like smallpox, it could be something like measles, but most recently, historian Cal Harper has argued that this plague was likely a, a viral, viral fever similar to Ebola. So if you are familiar with those symptoms, you can imagine what it would have been like uh, in the Roman Empire during the plague of Cyprian. Now, one of the most colorful accounts of how this plague manifested among the people comes from Bishop Cyprian, and he writes these words. As the strength of the body is dissolved, the bowels dissipate in a flow, a fire that begins in the inmost depths burns up into wounds in the throat. The intestines are shaken with continuous vomiting. The eyes are set on fire from the force of the blood as weakness prevails through the failures and losses of the body. The gait is crippled. The hearing is blocked. The vision is blinded. These are terrible and horrific symptoms 
and it's not only a terrible thing to endure, it was a terrible way to die, and many people did. It is estimated that up to 5,000 people died every day at the height of the plague of Cyprian. Now, we say all this to ask this question. How was it that Christians and non-Christians reacted very differently to the plague of Cyprian? Because we know that this plague, like any plague, did not discriminate. Uh, they were, they were, didn't look at one person and say, well, you believe this, so you're not going to be infected. It infected everybody, just as any disease or illness does. So both groups contracted the illness, but they reacted very different psychologically to it. The Christians believed that they had a duty to assist those in need. And so they saw this epidemic as an opportunity to put their beliefs into practice. They cared for the sick. They provided food and water. They uh, nursed others that were weak. They buried the dead. In his Easter letter around 260 AD, Dionysius wrote, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. And he equates their dedication and their courage in the face of this terrible illness with martyrdom. And it was true that these Christians faced this disease with surprising courage. Now, this was at a time before modern medicine, and there were a lot of theories as to how this particular plague was transmitted. Some people believed it was transmitted through the air. Some said it was by clothing, but many believed that you could receive the infection through line of sight. So if somebody was a victim to this plague and they simply gazed at you, you could also be infected. So the logic went. And so why is it that these Christians are drawing themselves physically close to the sick, definitely within line of sight, many becoming sick and dying themselves? What made the difference? for them to act this way. Now, I said that the Christians believed that this was a way that they could practice what their faith. And in fact, I think that the different reaction between the Christians and non-Christians rested in Christian theology. So Christians worship a God raised from the dead. They believe that death is not the end of all things, but a transition to eternal life. And so, buoyed by this promise of heaven, the early Christians believed, much as Dionysius does, that if they die in the service of their family, their friends, their community, then their reward is in heaven. And they follow the footsteps of Christian martyrs through the ages. Now, by contrast, the non-Christians did not react the same way to the plague. Just as, their, just as the people a uh, hundred years earlier during the plague of Antonine believed that this plague was caused by the displeasure of the gods, so the non-Christians believed that the plague was caused by the displeasure of the gods, and their response was to flee the city in droves. They fled, leaving sick friends and family to die. And Dionysius describes the scene uh, graphically that there were loved ones laying half dead on the side of the road while their families rushed away trying to escape what, what, might have, um, what might have been a certain death and maybe still was certain death from this epidemic. The epidemic then unraveled the social and religious fabric among non-Christians even while it strengthened the early church. Now, we have limited information from this time. And certainly what we have uh, historians criticize as being biased, either biased toward the non-Christian side or biased towards the Christian side. And as we pull this apart and try to make sense of the, the data and make sense of the accounts that we, we do have, we find, we find some certainties. One is that during this time of epidemic, the Christian community coalesced around caring for the sick. And because they did this in an orderly and peaceful way, their movement began to grow. People saw Christian hope worked out in Christian service. And what the Christians did, they did not do from a place of fear, but from a place of hope. So what does this mean for us today? 
what lesson can we learn from the early church facing these epidemics, some of them, um, each one more horrific than the one before, actually. Um, what do we learn from their experience and from their reaction and from the way that they gave an example in what it means to be a Christian during a health crisis? Well, I'm going to start with one caveat, and that is to say that living as a Christian in an epidemic in our modern days does not mean that we ignore medical advice. It doesn't mean that we rush out haphazardly, putting our community or ourselves at unnecessary risk. But I do think that it means we do not panic, and certainly that we do not despair. We remember that we worship a God who has risen from the grave. We read in Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 6, Jesus' followers, two of Jesus' followers, come to his tomb, and these two women meet an angel there. And the angel begins with the famous words that every angel seems to begin with, Do not be afraid. This is always the starting point. Do not be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. And so we start here. We worship a God who has risen. We worship a God who has risen. And for that reason, we need not fear death the way someone without hope might fear death. The second thing we remember is that we do not, we are called not to trust the power structures of the world. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but our trust is in the name of the Lord our God. Now, we can't quite wrap our minds around trusting in chariots or horses in this day and age, but we can wrap our minds around trusting in our mutual funds and our retirement plans. We can wrap our minds around trusting in our assets, whatever they are. And the fact is that the Old Testament is full of this warning not to trust in horses. Deuteronomy 17, 16 uh, actually prohibits the, the king, the future king of Israel, from uh, acquiring too many horses or going to Egypt to acquire too many horses because, again, the people of God are to put their trust in God, not in modern uh, in military advances. And so we remember that we do not have to trust in power. As power is displayed in our world, we are called to trust in God and to base all of our hope also in God. The third thing we remember is that God created our world with purpose and order. And we remember that God's purposes are good. In Romans 8.28, we read that we know all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And so even in times of disorientation and chaos, we trust that God has a plan, that God is in charge of it, God is sovereign over it. And we submit even those difficult, challenging, terrifying times to God's Lordship. And because we believe these things, we have the courage to open our hearts and open our hands to see how and where we can extend love and kindness and support during chaotic times, during even health crises and epidemics. And during these times, we have the courage not to fear. When we do not fear, we are able to live fully and freely as children of God. And when we do not fear, we live our lives from a place of love. What does that look like? I have a few ideas and you may have more. I think it looks like this. When we visit the grocery store, we recognize that we do not need all the toilet paper on the shelf or all the bread or all the bananas. And I know this is a problem because I went to the grocery store yesterday and they were completely out of all of these things. We don't need to panic when we live out of a place of love. We don't need to hoard when we live out of a place of love. We can trust that our needs will be provided for. 
When we live from a place of love, we honor the image of God in all people. We recognize that this virus, like the plagues from the past centuries, knows no nationality. It knows no city boundary. It affects us all. And so during these times, we flee from xenophobia and we hold accountable those who would stoke its fires. Third, when we live from a place of love, we recognize the needs of others. We are open not just to what we need, but to what others around us are desperate for, especially those who are most vulnerable, the medically fragile, the elderly, the poor. We move to meet those needs as best we can. And instead of asking, what can I bear to lose? What can I afford to lose? We instead ask, what can I give and how much? This is what it means to live from a place of love. And finally, when we live from a place of love, again, we are focused on others. We encourage one another, calling, texting, emailing, checking in, sharing photos or videos, staying connected, reminding each other and ourselves that we are not alone in this. And our hope, again, is based on Jesus. And the foundation of our hope cannot be shaken by the chaos that swirls around us. I believe that this is what it means to be a Christian during an epidemic. This is how we live free of fear and panic and despair. This is how we live lives full of peace and perseverance and hope. Thank you for joining our video class today. Please check out the links associated with this video for more information and some of the articles that have inspired me. And may the peace of Christ be with you now and always.